In 55 BC, when Julius Caesar first arrived in Britain, he reported seeing druids, human sacrifices, unspeakable acts by Britons in honour of their Celtic gods. A hundred years later, Rome introduced its own religion into Britain with, yes, more blood and gore and lots of pomp and theatre. And where did they do all this? In temples, of course. Not that time teams had much luck finding any. That was until we were shown this aerial photograph. Look at these square features. They stick out a bit, don't they? Even the most sceptical archaeologists think that these are Romano-British temples. So will the gods at last look down favourably upon us for three days in this Hertfordshire field? Surely we can find one this time. When the Romans arrived in Iron Age Britain, they didn't just transform the country's roads, buildings and economy. Even gods and rituals were shaped by Roman influence. This field in Hertfordshire could take us into the heart of that story. It's at Friars Wash, just five miles northwest of St Albans, one of Roman Britain's major centres. The site first came to the attention of archaeologists during a hot summer in the 1970s, when an aerial survey showed up some unusual features. These squares look remarkably like the footprints of Roman temples. But these distinctive buildings are rarely found in Britain. Even Time Team, after 15 years, has yet to discover an entire Roman temple. Francis, I have a terrible sense of deja vu about this one. How many times on Time Team have we gone on day one, oh, we may have a Roman temple here, and do we get a Roman temple? Yeah, um... You mean, yeah, no? <laughs> <laughs> they have proved elusive, Tony. <laughs> they certainly have. <laughs> but, Tony, when you've got aerial photographs of that quality with crop marks like that and you've got a plan that is a square within a square, it screams out of you. Roman temple. But even if it is a temple, we don't know that there's any of it left. It could all have been ploughed out, couldn't it? Well, look, Tony, you can see there's a definite rise in the field over there. Where Emma and Stuart are. And um, that worries me a little bit because, you know, that's where ploughing is often worse. That's right. But on the other side of that, where the, the plough soil moves down the slope, it could actually preserve the lower parts. OK, so what do we do? Well, uh, first of all, I mean, despite the fact we've got beautiful results on the aerial photograph, we're going to put the geophysics over it. And then once we got the results from that, we should put a trench in. Well, I thought you'd say we'd put a trench in. It is an archaeology programme. <laughs> where? <laughs> well, I think you want to go straight through the middle of that temple. I mean, let's go for where we're going to discover something. Why don't we go straight through that way. After all, we've got two temples. We ought to try and establish a relationship. Yeah, I'm not worried about that now, Phil. We can sort out relationships later. Phil, You're... Phil. He's pulling rank on me. He absolutely <laughs> is. You don't ask questions, you dig. He tells you where to dig, all right? Let's get on with it. Off you go. <laughs> to find our potential temples, Henry's got the difficult task of using a 30-year-old photograph to find the site in the modern-day field. But having finally pinpointed the spot, Geophys, get going. If these are Roman temples, we hope to find the wall around the centre, known as the Keller, along with an outer wall which forms a corridor called an ambulatory, where the people on pilgrimage here would have walked. But that's if plough damage has left anything for us to find. Guys, the time's getting on. Why isn't the digger up? Well, we've got to decide exactly where to go, Tony. Yeah, and you said you'd do the geophys and then you would dig on it. Yeah, yeah. And we've got a slight problem in that the temples are really clear in the aerial photograph. Yeah. And, well, they're not quite so clear on the geophysics. Can you explain why? Well, I think they've actually been plough damaged over ah! the years. Oh, I, 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 that's my feeling. Ah. Look, I know I don't know much about archaeology, but I do know about the pathetic human <laughs> optimism that, that we seduces allowed, you We both allowed for plough damage. We oh. told you. We told you. Oh, oh our Tony, there's going to be a temple here. <laughs> and it this might be plough damage. I, I, I might be wrong. It could be that just because it's a temple, it doesn't show as a magnetic anomaly. 
But the thing is, we've got a sort of general footprint, and the idea is we'll trench from in the middle, working our way outwards. So the yeah. fact that that is looking roughly circular doesn't mean much. You it's don't not think. roughly circular. No, it's, it's rectangular. Yeah. Does that actually tally up at all with the aerial photographs? Yeah, it's in the right part Have of the field. Have you got the aerial photographs? Well, there. There's that cross fill, there. And you can see the rectangle on the aerial photograph, and there's More the rectangle. More or less like that. Yeah. So not what's wrong with that? Now, before you two start again... Roughly circular or rectangle, I leave it to the viewer to decide. <laughs> Let's put a trench from the middle, go out in that direction, and we'll make it double yeah. width, OK? But it's going to be damaged. Double width trench, and let's do it. Let's do it now. It does seem hard, doesn't it? It does. So, from the fuzzy geophys results, it looks like ploughing might have damaged any structures. But undaunted, Phil opens our first trench to find out what has survived. Because anything we can salvage from a temple site will be important, as archaeological evidence of Roman religion in Britain is rare. But from Roman accounts, we do know that when the Romans arrived, they encountered Brits who already had their own gods, druids and sacrifices. Were the Romans fanatical about their religion? When they came over here, did they burn down all the shrines and assert their new religion? On the contrary, Tony, no. They tended to be a very superstitious and religious people, and they would prefer to identify the local deities and find their nearest Roman equivalent. So we get a mix, such as Apollo, the classical god, being equated with the local Cunamaglos, or Mars with Tutatis. So, broadly, a very encompassing attitude. But having said that, there were um, things that they really couldn't cope with. They could not deal with human sacrifice. Yeah, they? that's true. Uh, which was something that was practised in Iron Age Britain, and that was just a step too far for the Romans. It was outlawed. Who built these temples, Mark? These are very much local ventures, I think, Tony. Um, it, it's the local aristocracy, the local elite, who had been the bigwigs in the Iron Age, have made the transition to civilised Romano-British gentlemen, and it's basically a local temple for local people. Back on site, and Phil's faith oh. that there is something left to find has been rewarded. A bit of mortar there, isn't it? Or is it? If I was uh, expecting walls in this stuff, I'd expect them to be made out of flints. Yeah, they are. They are big flints. Might be, uh, it might be a bit risky in early days, but would you pick up anything like this, Sir John? We've only done magnetics so far. No. That's all you wouldn't do. No. See, look, there's big stones here. I'm a little bit more hopeful about that. Suddenly, it seems possible that there could be archaeology that survived plough damage. With walls emerging, everyone descends on the trench to try and work out what was once here. And by halfway through day one, our search for a Roman building seems one step closer to its goal. <laughs> a real wall this time. Absolutely. Some really, really good archaeology, Mark. And far, far better than we'd ever expected. Yeah. I and mean, we thought the whole thing was going to be ploughed away. But look, I mean, we've got this superb wall coming through here. Yeah, it's substantial. It must be, what, nearly a metre wide? That's right. As far as I can see at the moment, that looks very much as though it's on the outside. Yeah. But here, you look, we've got this beautiful flooring preserved. So I think we're in the inside here. And we can yeah. trace it going back right through the yeah, whole length of the Yeah, you can see you've trench. got mortar and plaster and stuff on this side, haven't you? Absolutely. Yeah, excellent. But we haven't just got a wall. There's now also tesserae or floor tiles coming up. That's a tessera. Uh, that's, it. that's a better one, isn't it? That's nice and smooth on the top and then loads of mortar on the bottom. Oh, yeah, where it's stuck in. Yeah, there is loads of them. That's one there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have the whole floor soon. I'm sure that some of these used to be roof tile. So there's loads sense. of roof tile. And, and they're just sort of smashed up from there, I think. Not very high quality, <laughs> low low quality. Would do the job though, wouldn't, wouldn't it? Indeed, yeah. <laughs> From the enormous number of plain tesserae emerging, we think this structure had a plain mosaic floor, which is what we'd expect from a temple building. 
We'd also expect concentric walls, leaving a walkway some three metres wide. And then another wall appears. Oh, look, there it is. Oh, look at that. That's better, isn't it? Yeah, I'll buy that. I mean, if we're going for two or three metres, it looks like we've got a wall coming along here, turning here. One, two metres on the button. Hey? Oh. That's hell of a, that's hell of a stride you got there. <laughs> that's hell of a lot more than two metres. One, two, I'll make that three metres. All right. Now, crucially, that is so vitally important because it's not unreasonable to assume that maybe we've got two to three metres on that side. Yeah. If we can pinpoint all the outside walls and the inside walls as well, we, we, we're nearly there. I reckon we'll have cracked it then. Well, I think that might be a bit <laughs> cautious not cracked it. Getting close, though. <laughs> so Francis thinks we've found the outer or ambulatory wall of a temple surrounding a walkway some three metres wide. And within the hour, Bridge finds something on the other side. So, Phil, looks like I found your wall here. Look, this looks really good for the base of a wall, and it's about a metre extending towards you. It is more substantial than I thought it was, but crucially, it's bang on where I thought it ought to be. We've come two to three metres off this Keller wall, predicted there's a wall there, and we got it. I like it. It's great. At last, after 15 years of trying to unearth a Roman temple, we seem to be discovering an entire building. But as so often on Time Team, nothing's as simple as it seems. John, I don't understand it. I mean, down in the trenches, it's quite clear what's happening. You can recognise ditches. You had that fantastic 1976 air photo, but the geophys and the air photos don't seem to marry up. I'm in a bit of a muddle. Is it just me? <laughs> no, it's not just you. <laughs> I, I don't know what's going on. I mean, we did the magnetics this morning, and, well, we sort of got an outline of the one temple. We've tried resistance now, and, look, when you draw the outlines of where the temple should be, OK, we've got something that goes with that one, but look at this. There's nothing in the resistance data that correlates with that. I simply don't understand what's going on. I mean, are we quite sure we're in the right temples for a start? Uh, yes. Right. We're, we're there or thereabouts, but <laughs> it, it just doesn't make sense. John and Francis aren't the only ones to think that something's odd. Stuart, suspecting the high-tech approach has led us astray, goes back to some antiquated methods. Back at the trench, and despite the strange geophysics, Francis remains convinced of what we've got. This morning, you told me that on this mound, we would find this. Yeah. And we've got one, Tony, I'm sure of it. Look, right in the middle there, you see that flint wall, and it goes through a right angle in front of where Trace is troweling. Yeah. That is the wall of a central tower, the Keller. Yeah. OK, and then behind it, you can see there's more flint. That's because it's got a raised floor, and they often had raised floors. Then on the outside, there's a walkway, which is about three metres wide, and it's got a wall. The outside wall is here. So that would be this wall here? That's that wall, and so Tracy's actually troweling in the walkway. Yeah. And then if you come round this way, yeah. the walkway wall is... In this trench here? You've got it. So that would be here? That's right, yes. What about fines? Right. Well, what we're getting is not the sort of stuff you'd expect in a house. We're getting roof tile, we're getting bits of floor tile, but we're not getting domestic rubbish like bones, we're not getting pottery. It's a very distinctive and unusual collection of finds, the sort of thing you get in a temple. Which is what you predicted. So are we done and dusted? No, I don't think so, Tony. Um, We've got to prove it absolutely. And I think this wall coming in here and this one coming in here, they'll meet up at that point down there. So it's looking very good, but we're not quite there yet. No, we're very nearly there. If Francis is right, an entire Roman temple is just within our grasp. 
End of day one, and miracle upon miracles, it looks as though we may have found something that we've been searching for on Time Team for 15 years, an undiscovered Roman temple. All we've got to do is to take out that square there, and hopefully we'll find the temple corner, except that some people are just a little bit sceptical. Well, I've been listening to everything that Francis has been saying, and, and I don't think he could be more wrong. I think he's digging in the wrong place. Typical time team. We'll find out who's right tomorrow. Beginning of day two, and yesterday evening, Francis told me that this big stone square bit here was the central core of a Roman temple, and all round it was what he called the ambulatory, the pathway that went round that central core. How fantastic to get a Roman temple on day one. Not only that, but to have nailed its layout, except it now appears that Francis was completely, totally wrong. Stuart and John, you're the leaders of this little revolution. What have you been saying to him? Look, he's practically in tears. Well, to be fair to Francis, I mean, we were confused yesterday. Henry thought we'd got two temples here. When we looked at the resistance results, it worked well with the northern temple, but it just didn't make sense with the southern temple because there was nothing in the results that would match that. Well, Stuart's actually solved it. <laughs> well, the, the problem was that Henry was trying to get the con computer to do something it couldn't really do because the photograph was very oblique. So I went back to the old-fashioned techniques of a, of a ruler, an air photograph, and a straight line. You can see features on here which still exist on the ground. We've got this nice straight hedge line here. We've got a bungalow over here. And both those features still survive. And if you draw the straight line between the hedge line and the bungalow, it goes right through the middle of the two temple sites. So if you trace that line on the ground, which I've done with the poles, it goes right up the middle there. And when Francis was describing what he thought was that, you could see he was actually on this side of the line here. It couldn't be that temple. And it was clear we had one temple this side of the line, there, and we had another temple under the grass of that side. So the good news is you've still got a temple, it's just that we were digging the wrong one. That's it, Tony. Well, actually, you know, the good news is we've got two temples. So yesterday we thought we were here on the photograph, where, in fact, we were here. The man behind this mistake was Henry, who had difficulty relating the 1970s photograph to the modern field. So he now has to replot the two temples. Henry, after the fiasco of yesterday's surveying, <laughs> you'd better get this right. Of course, of course. What can go wrong, Phil? With the confusion cleared up, we can get on with the task of untangling the walls that make up these rare temple buildings. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we're in a maze of, of possible walls. <laughs> yes, you've got more potential walls than the builders' merchants at the moment. Yeah. Bridge is extending the trench to reveal the walls of the Keller. It was this sacred centre of the temple that was the focus for religious ceremonies. When I was a choir boy many moons ago, I used to go to church every Sunday. I went to matins in the morning and even song in the evenings. Would our temple worshippers have gone to their temple with the same kind of regularity? I'm still trying to recover from the horrific change in you as an adult, Tony. No, the, the truth is that the Roman year was divided into a cycle of festivals that were tied to the seasons, they were tied to imperial birthdays, they were tied to days dedicated to particular gods. We don't know who was worshipped here yet. People could have come here on a regular basis. They may have come for an annual festival tied to a fair, a bit like how in the medieval era you had things like St Bartholomew's Fair or St Margaret's Fair, so there's a religious component and there's also perhaps um, a commercial social aspect to it as well. What went on inside the temples? I don't think an awful lot would have been going on inside because you have to remember that first of all they're very small and secondly the keller, the central bit, was the private space of the god and his attendants, the priests. And I find that quite amazing to think that the, 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 all of the force of the god was done without anybody else seeing, so I don't really understand that guy. The whole thing works on magic. The priests are the special men who have access to the magic. They've learnt all the special words. It's their thing. They jealously protect it. It's a little bit like a Masonic cult. If we were Romans now, could we invent a god right here, the hay god or whatever? No, you don't get it. The point is the god is here already. You have to identify that and access his power. 
But Guy, while you were saying that, this hay moved in a mysterious way. From other temple sites, we know that ceremonies and rituals weren't just confined to the temple buildings. Altars and shrines could be built in the area outside, and just next to our temples, John spotted something on the geophys. What's this red line? You're putting another trench in? Yeah, we've expanded the resistance survey. And look, we've got the temples there, and we've got this superb ring feature, well, with a, a central sort of blob. What do you think it might be, Francis? Well, the ring ditch looks like it could be around the outside of a Bronze Age barrow, with the central thing being a grave. I'm not certain that that's a ditch. Right. I think it could actually be a, a stony feature, a, a flint wall. Right. If you had a circular flint wall here, yeah. would it be associated with the temple? Um, well, if it, yes, uh, it, it certainly that rules it out being a Bronze Age barrow. Um, it's more likely then to be a Roman mausoleum going with the temple, or perhaps a shrine also going with the temple. So what might be in it? Well, all sorts of things. I mean, very. Well, that's why we're going to dig it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Ask us any question. <laughs> Intrigued by this circular structure, which may hold a Roman shrine, Phil opens Trench 2. As the morning unfolds, we're beginning to unravel the two temples we came here to investigate. But there are also other features on the aerial photograph that may help us understand the site. Running beside the temples are what appear to be three ditches that could be a road or bank of some kind. So to investigate, we extend Trench 1. I want to go down, you know, so that it's really clear, because if it won't define up, we could waste a lot of time. We've only got a day and a half. We're also still looking for evidence of ceremony outside the main buildings. And it's not long before Francis is called away to look at yet more geophys results. OK, so what have we got, John? Well, look, on the aerial photograph, we've got the two temples now. Yeah. We've got the ring feature. Mm. But if you come this way, there's a sort of splurge at that point there. We've now looked at it with resistance. So again, follow that line between the two temples. We've got a clear high resistance response. I mean, that suggests to me a, a sort of small building structure at this point. Well, I mean, that's where you'd expect to find one. I mean, we're in the yard outside the, the main temples, and it's in these yards, these open spaces, that that's where you get the, the sacrifices and, and, and the religious offerings. A sort of altar? Yes, an altar, something like that. But, uh, I mean, we, you know, we'll only know by putting a hole in it, so that's what we must do, I think. After lunch? Yes. So Francis decides to open a third trench over the splurge that could be an altar. While so back in there. Phil's trench... Ah, there we go. ..the blob <laughs> on the geophysics is turning up trumps. Well, I'm damned. I shall get a brush, Phil, is well, the first I'm thing damned. I'm going to do. Who would have believed that? <laughs> there you go, Phil. God, oh, look at that. Hey. So that's the mortar that it was yeah, that I it know, was I know, I into. Know, and it's just sitting in the bottom here, look. Well, in that nose. Phil? <laughs> they're jumping up and down saying that look, you've got some kind of floor. We have look, a little mosaic floor, look. Wow. Look, look, isn't that isn't that beautiful? That's a surprise, isn't it? Well it is, totally. So do you think that this is what John was seeing in the geophys? I'm almost certainly, yeah. Well, in that case. There could be a heck of a lot of it. Oh, look at that. It's a coin. <laughs> really, you couldn't ask for a better gift than a coin lying on the floor. It really is a gift. <laughs> Can you tell much about it? No, it's, it's just wafer thin. In fact, there's a hole that goes right the way through it. And I certainly don't want to... I certainly don't want to risk trying to brush it, because if there is any detail on it, I might lose it, but... That's turned it into quite a good sight, this, isn't it? Yeah, God, ah. Cleaning reveals the coin to be third century, meaning that Phil's mosaic floor had to have been laid before that date. Back on site, and another great find is emerging. Mark, what do you think of that? Oh, my word, look at that. It's lovely, isn't it? Now, that's in fabulous condition. That's Constantine the First, or Constantine the Great, as he's known to history. Flip it over, and it's the sun god, Sol. 
And isn't it fantastic to have a coin with a pagan god and it's the emperor who converts to Christianity and found on a temple site? It's just yes, a lovely little, it's, it's, little it's microcosm of why we're here. Yes, isn't it? While in our temple, Bridge is extending the trench to reveal the whole keller. It's here in this sacred centre that we might expect offerings to have been left to the gods. And soon enough... What is it, Bridge? Well, it's the most beautiful oh. enamelled brooch. Oh, look at that. Oh, beautiful plate brooch, enamel. That green area was probably originally white enamel, but we can see that there are little spots of red here too. Second century, usually, those types. Guy. And the, the crescent on the top makes me think immediately of the moon. Yes. And if that's right, then that would mean it's the goddess Diana yes. Luna. Well, that would be great, because I've actually found it inside the cala in the temple. Ah, but it doesn't mean the temple was dedicated yeah. to her. She might just have been one of many gods or goddesses dedicated to here. Oh, but don't squash on it just yet, Guy, please. I'm not. Anyway, it's a lovely find, isn't it? Beautiful. It's well done. Great. Tea time on day two and we're beginning to paint a vivid picture of our Romano-British temple and the very things that were part of day-to-day -day life here. But as time ticks on, we've still got a lot of questions about this site to answer. We've now dug across the huge feature on the aerial photograph that looks like three ditches, but we still don't know what it is exactly. So Stuart sets off to investigate. The landscape could give us clues. Importantly, our site is below a major Roman road that leads to Verulamium, Roman St Albans. But there's also a river system next to our temples, and we think that in Roman times it might have flooded. So Henry's coring in order to understand how it would have impacted on our site. Back at our third trench and where we thought we might have an altar, we've got walls. Guy, right, do come and have a look at this because this is absolutely gorgeous. Helen, right. can you talk Guy through this? Can, yes. Do you remember on the aerial photographs, yep. those two temples and a little square shape underneath them, south of them? Yeah. Well, here is our square wall. Now, I'm hoping that it could possibly turn into maybe an external altar. What do you reckon, at first glance? Well, no, it's just too up for grabs, because Helen's quite right. It might be an altar, but it might be a kiosk. A, place a what? Where, a kiosk. You a go kiosk? To, you go to kiosks, don't you? Haven't you been to a kiosk to buy something? If you come to a place like this, there's going to be stuff for sale. I'm thinking sacred zone. I'm thinking burnt animals on altars. You've got to remember that all these Roman religious establishments were commercial outfits as well. They needed places to flog off those goods so that the punter could buy it so he could give a gift to the god. Helen is seductively waving a finds bag at us. What is this? I'm pretty sure that's a nice little piece of burnt bone. Careful. It's not very thoroughly burnt and it's a bit squishy. That's what I think it is. <laughs> it looks a bit more like a bird dropping, but if, if she's right and indeed it is a piece of burnt bone, we know that they burnt animals as offerings, so actually it's quite plausibly a bit of a ritual. And what have you got here? Well, three bits of dating evidence. There you go. Or coins, as we often call them in English. Yeah. Yes, it's... Um... You're very waspish this <laughs> yeah. afternoon, aren't you? Well, they're small. They're about the size of a five-pence piece, the third or fourth century, and, in fact, that one with the little radiate crown on, I can tell you, is third century. So we've got something that's third, fourth century. It's on a sacred site. We've got burning. This isn't a kiosk, is it? They're not flogging football programmes here. This is this is an altar or something. Look, what we've got here is a really interesting structure that lies right on the middle line between the two temples. Down over there, you've got Roman St Albans. This has got to be a major monument of some sort that is going to greet the visitor coming into the temple. Guy, is it exciting? For the first time in many years, I can actually feel it registering on my excitometer. In fact, it's the first time I've even seen a temple on time to. Oh, that's good. Come on! Well, if Guy seems happy, Phil's engrossed by what's coming up in his trench. He's got a substantial wall, and within that, an intriguing square chalk feature. By the end of an exceptional day two, we've discovered not just two Roman temples, but an entire temple complex. 
I don't think I can remember a time team where we've had three such tasty trenches in such a small area. It's been fantastic, Tony. Well, you remember that circular thing that we thought could have been a Bronze Age barrow? Yes. Well, it turns out it's got a circular wall around the outside. It's a Roman shrine, and in the middle there, you can see the base of a, of a chalk uh, altar base made out of piled up chalk and then fitted within a box made out of wood. And over here in this trench, we think we've got another altar, although Guy thinks it's a kiosk, but we're working on him. And over here, we've got the trench with the two temples in it. But it is tantalising, isn't it? Because it's all structures, not people. That's right, Tony. That's why we want to go down. And I think we'll actually get evidence for what was going on here, the rituals, you know, the sacrifices and things. And as a first hint, when we were going down in the keller, right up against the wall, we found this. Now, I don't know what it is. It may have gone in a little recess in the wall, but it looks to me, for all the world, like a head. So if we've got this prehistoric ET tonight, what are we gonna to find tomorrow when we go down further? Does it remind you of somebody? When we came here two days ago, we thought, with a bit of luck, we might find a Roman temple. But what we actually have found has exceeded our wildest expectations. We've got a whole temple complex, complete with ritual finds and not one, but two temples. At least that's what I thought until a few minutes ago. But, Francis, <laughs> it's not two temples, is it? No, it's three, Tony. Um, this is a temple, I'm in no doubt about it. And look right at the center there, that big white square, that's the foundation for an altar. It's made out of chalk that's been dumped there, and underneath it, I think, we'll probably find foundation deposits, offerings, that sort of thing. How are you going to dig it, Phil? Obviously, the main focus of our efforts will be on that altar base, but we don't want to take that altar base in isolation. What we've got to do is see how it relates to all the rest of the deposits in the temple. So what I'll do is I'll run out a slot right through from that altar base, through the floors, through the wall, outside the temple. See how that temple was put together, see how it was used, but more crucially, when it was built. Yesterday, we did have some lovely finds, but the buzz is today, we could get even more down there. I think we will, but I think the key thing is that what we discover is going to tell us about what people were doing here, the behaviour, the rituals, and that's what really matters. Our mission to understand the people here has already unearthed important evidence. Yesterday, we found one of Time Team's most tantalising finds, a rare type of stone that we believe was chosen for the temple because it looks like a human head. It was found in the Keller, the sacred centre of the temple. And with only one day left, Bridge is now digging down into the Keller in the hope of finding yet more evidence of ritual. We've also opened a trench over what could be an altar or a kiosk for religious goods. And as day three gets underway, it's here that an archaeological deluge begins. Hi, Helen. I, I hear there's been some excitement over here. Yes, we've got a lot of bronze coins. Yeah. Now, as you know, if there's more than ten bronze coins from a single find, yeah. we need to report them under the 1996 Treasure Act. Yeah. So what I, what I want to know from you, though, is do you think that they represent a hoard. Have they gone into the ground together? Yeah. Let's have a How look. Many have we Let's got? have a look. We've got two late third century coins. We've got one of the early 320s. The majority are all between 330 and 340, 41, and there's one that we can't identify yet until it's been conserved and cleaned. In my opinion, that's a deliberate deposit, a group deposit. It's a hoard. And that means, presumably, it's gone into the ground as an offering, not, a, not as a bank to keep safe, but as we're at a mm. temple, as an offering. Oh, I think in this context, yes, it's a deliberate grouped offering. Fantastic. So excellent, and it's the kind of thing you expect to find on a temple site, and we got one. Brilliant. With archaeology appearing in the ground at every turn, the pressure's on to excavate this substantial ceremonial complex. And Stuart's been busy investigating why people chose this spot to show their devotion. Critically, our site's in a river valley. And it's also beside Watling Street, a Roman road that led to Verulamium. Stuart, 
Why do you think the temples are here and not somewhere else? <laughs> That's a simple question to ask. Do you remember the, the triple ditch system we saw in the field over there? That's part of a monumental prehistoric land boundary which went all the way from the ridge on the top over there down the valley side, across the river bottom here and up the side of this valley. And I think what happens in the Roman period is that boundary is is still an important political statement, the edge of a territory and what have you. So if you're coming out from St Albans, this is the point at which you leave that valley and you want to make an offering to the gods, safe journey onwards, and the same coming back in. It's sort of where two zones actually meet. Guy, do you buy the idea that the Romans came here and they used the existing territorial boundaries for their own devices? Yes, because the whole idea behind the Roman system is that you come in and you rebrand the existing system of hierarchy and patronage so that you exploit social systems to run it the Roman way. In Roman times, people would have known this as an impressive ceremonial complex located at an important position on the route to St Albans. Today, this site is so exceptional that leading experts are on hand to try and make sense of the three temples. At least this morning we thought it was three. Francis! We've extended this trench now. I thought it was just a kiosk. <laughs> no, it's not a kiosk, Tony. It's another temple. Another temple? Yes, I, I'm pretty certain of that because it's got a tower keller like the other two over there. And um, I think the key thing now is to extend our trench. Let's see if it's got a walkway wall. Then I think we put it to bed, we plan it. and We can't hope to dig it. We've got far too much to do. So we've got two temples there, one there, yeah. one there. Yeah. Is that four temples or am I dreaming? It's four temples, Tony, and this is now turning into a major Roman temple complex. I mean, it is of national importance. Once that's sorted out, Tony, what's your priority? It would be this part of the site over here. We've got a circular temple and we've got a square platform in the centre of it and it's only the second of its type in the whole country and we need to find out its exact function and get some dating evidence from it. What's your strategy going to be, Francis? Well, we'll put a slot through the centre of the circular temple from the altar platform to the wall. That should give us all the dating we need and the relationship of the various features. How important do you think this site is? I mean, it's breathtakingly important, Tony. It's because the preservation is so good. It's actually quite a, a big responsibility. There's a lot of pressure on you today. No, not much. <laughs> <laughs> so we look for two temples, then four turn up. And with just hours left, we're faced with hugely important archaeology that we've got to make sense of. In Bridges Trench, we've got our first two temples, we've got another square temple next door, while Phil has his rare circular temple to excavate. We're also trying to understand why such a huge temple complex was built in this Hertfordshire field, and Henry's work on the river is giving us more evidence. What you can see is our, our temple site just here. Now, what struck me immediately from this data was that up the river channel up here, um, the stream channel, we've actually got these, this confluence of three different tributaries. Now, those sort of confluences, as far as I understand, France, they're, they're quite significant. In prehistory, particularly in the Iron Age, water was crucially important to people. It, it was a, the boundary between the world of the living and the world of the dead. You went into water and you died and you were in the, in the realm of the ancestors. The thing about the, the, the Romans was that they don't seem to have had one overarching water god. They, they have little gods for specific places. So you've got Sulis Minerva at Bath, where you've got an amazing hot spring. And then you have somebody else like, like the goddess Coventina, who is only known from one site near Hadrian's Wall. So uh, as yet, we don't know which god might have controlled our water. Well, it's, it's, it's quite weird, because we've already said uh, confluences and streams being important. But we actually do know something about the nature of the water on site here because the, the coring worker did. It's shown that it's quite a wide sort of floodplain area, mm. but very shallow river or rivulets, mm. very multiple channels and very slow moving. So at certain times of year, this field would have been surrounded by water, giving it religious significance. And with the diggers at full steam ahead, we're getting more evidence of that religion by the hour. Guy, these were found by Faye in her trench and she says they're curses. What does she mean? Almost every time when you come to a site, we're detached, really, from the original people. 
a religious site is one of the rare occasions that you get a bit of writing, some evidence of that relationship between those people and their lives. There's no writing there. Yeah, there will be. These are rolled up sheets of lead. When they're unrolled, they'll probably have handwriting on them and it will be that message to the god saying that you want such and such a thing. What kind of things do they say? It could be incredibly petty. Imagine, for example, your cloak's been nicked or that sort of thing. You go along to the temple and you say, so-and-so's done this terrible thing to me. I plead to you, the goddess or the god, that this person has their house fall down or something horrific like that. This thing gets rolled up, it gets deposited on the temple site and the person goes away hoping, of course they paid for this, so they go away hoping that this service will be performed for them by the god or goddess and if they think that it has, they'll come back and they'll leave a gift which is the other half of the contract. So they might leave an altar here or a gift of food like that burnt bone saying, thanks very much. Are these very common? No, they're not at all. And to find some in a religious context like this is really very unusual. So people came here to make offerings and ask the gods to fulfil their desires. And if you want to know more about Roman gods, visit the Time Team website. Back in our first trench, and with just half a day left, traces uncovering a walkway visitors would have once trod. It strikes me that that walkway surface is much lower than the other ones on the site, is it? Yeah, I mean, it's lower than the ambulatory. Yeah. So, I mean, it's almost like you would have stepped up and then maybe a step up into the keller in the centre. I mean, you know, this is fascinating, but it sort of implies that the level at which you're walking is something to do with the level of sanctity of the, of the temple. So, out here on the fringes, you're lower down, you get into the ambulatory around the central keller and you're up. And then in the keller itself, you know, you're, you're quite well up and, of course, the keller is a great tower. I think there's some symbolism here that we might have missed before. A Romano-British visitor to this site would have found temples designed to inspire awe and wonder. But they'd also have encountered a mass of other people coming to pay devotion. The more this dig goes on, the more I get a picture up the far end of the field of these yes. four temples surrounded by great crowds all dancing and banging drums and the guys bare to the waist, a bit of <laughs> long hair, people putting these curses into the walls with great shouts and wails and generally everybody having a good time. Is there anything like how you think it might have been? I don't know what I can possibly add to that. It's the perfect picture. No, you're quite right. It's not like the Christian church ceremony. This is a much more, if you like, brutal pagan world, which is much closer to the landscape. It's much closer to the visible sense of death and sacrifice. It's a much harder landscape than the one we live in today. Remember, these are people who lived in permanent terror of the unpredictability of the natural world. A thunderstorm, a rainstorm, your crop being ruined. They're perpetually trying to control this through religion. On a more mundane note, what about transport? How did they get here? Another thing that's very big in the landscape here is, is Watling Street. Where is it? Um, it's, it's not the first line of trees, it's the second line. You can just about see it on the horizon. So we're, we're actually very visible from Watling Street. And so maybe that's why the temple is where it is. You you know I'm a relentless cynic. By being close to the road, it makes this place a successful commercial establishment. You've got to get the punters in, haven't you? You know what this place would have been like? The Glastonbury Festival on a really awful summer. Ooh. And how close is that to the M5? On site, it's now a race against time to make sense of the entire religious complex. In our third temple, Phil's finding that under his chalk base, there are no fines, but a huge flint foundation. Well, I'm getting these flints up. What's Guess what's underneath? <laughs> More chalk. So with only hours to go, he faces a tricky excavation. Next door, with time running out, Bridge has finally revealed the keller of our first temple. What you got, Bridge? Well, Tony, we now have the whole keller exposed. Got very few finds actually coming out of it. We've got this floor tile here with some little dog paw prints inside it. And we've also got this really lovely silver coin from the Emperor Trajan dated to about 98 AD. What about structures? Well, actually, we're getting a really nice sequence of events coming up now. And in fact, you actually walked through where the entrance would be when you came in the trench down that plank, just over there. We've got demolition phases here, right here in front of me. Then we 
seem to have the remnants of the original floor surface here. And then under that, we've got the bedding layers. And into that, we've got these two post holes that are being excavated now with a third here that seem to represent an earlier phase of temple. So what's the big story of this trench? Well, I think the key thing might be that head we found yesterday. Because I think that could be um, the god or the spirit, the deity, that they were worshipping, that they dedicated this temple to. It meant an awful lot to the people here, enough to build this huge tower and this temple. And Phil has unearthed an even rarer temple, one of the most important buildings we've ever dug on Time Team. Phil, are you confident now that you know what we've got here? Oh, absolutely, Tony. You see this brown soil in front of us? Well, that is like a literally like a garden soil, and it's got first and second century pottery in it. So I don't think that the temple was here, here at that stage. But the floor of the temple, which is literally the surface that we're walking on, we've got third century pottery there on the floor of the temple, which is where we're standing now and we've got third century coin from the tessellated pavement there. So I'm pretty sure that the temple itself is third century. When you look at the construction of it, you see there we've, we've gone through the wall and you see the depth of the foundations, they are massive. Mm. So imagine just how big the wall above it's gonna be. But if you really want massive, have a look at the massive foundation for this main altar or shrine base. It may look like they've just heaved in a load of flints just randomly, but when you actually start to unpick it, you can see that it's alternating layers of flints and chalk. It's all been tamped down time after time, Absolutely. Isn't it? And, and, of course, you don't build a foundation like that unless you're going to put something absolutely massive on top, like a, an enormous altar or a, a, a full-size statue. It's seriously big. So we think our temple complex looked like this. In one temple center was a sacred stone, a focus of devotion for the many who processed around the temple. On the site, Romano-British visitors offered curses and coins, sacrificed animals, and then prayed to the gods at a huge monument inside a circular temple. Is this as rare as we thought it was when we first saw it? Well, in my career, I've never seen one. And, of course, I've, I've talked to the Roman experts around here. They've never seen them either. So, yes, it is genuinely rare. And you were the guy who said we wouldn't find any temples. Cut that bit. <laughs> <laughs>